each time noticing something different and wondering how they missed that before. This is why it is important that we read and reread and study the Holy Scriptures. Something that we need to hear today may jump out at us and help us to be encouraged. A year from now, if we hear the exact same scripture, something completely different may mean a lot to us, and we will wonder how we missed it before. Talk together as a family about today's scriptures. Which one encouraged each of you the most? Do you feel more encouraged than you did at the start of today's episode? Perhaps you'll want to listen to this again soon to see if there's anything else that your soul needed to hear, but you missed the first time around. Each time we read it, as we prepared it, we came away with something new, and we think you might too. You've been listening to Tending the Garden of Our Hearts, Meditations for Orthodox Families, with Elisa Bielitich and Christina Wenger. Elisa also hosts Raising Saints and Everyday Orthodox on Ancient Faith Radio, and you'll find her books in our bookstores. Christina hosts Let Us Attend on Ancient Faith Radio and writes for the Orthodox Christian Parenting Blog. The Crucifixion of the King of Glory, which is supposed to be released March 15th, 2022. And I sure hope it is released on time because it will be difficult if it doesn't come out on time after we've been talking about it. It should, but with COVID, there's all kinds of little complications. It was kind of a struggle, but everybody at Ancient Faith Press has worked very hard to make this book a reality there are a lot of um, different processes that are involved in writing a book. And right now, Matushka Trudy and I are meeting electronically every morning. She's in Indiana and I'm here in California. And I'm reading the book out loud for the audible version of the book. So this one, like Thinking Orthodox, will be released in print. It will be available electronically in Kindle. And it will also be available for for um, to listen to it you know, to to me read it, that's called audible. And um, even as I'm reading it out loud, which I have to read only exactly what is printed in the book itself. And I, by the way, I'm not allowed to say or, or tell about any of the footnotes. And some of the footnotes are kind of interesting. And um, 
if you, to get to access the footnotes and the citations for a lot of these things, um, you're going to have to get the written or print copy of the book. I'm sure it will be inexpensive, like uh, Thinking Orthodox was also relatively inexpensive. Or I guess you could get it with the Kindle version. There you will see the footnotes also. But there's a lot of good information in the footnotes. But um, even when I'm reading it out loud, uh, Presbyter Trudy is following along on her copy to make sure I don't make a mistake and say the wrong word when I'm reading, and sometimes I do. And I'm just bringing that up because even though I'm reading it from the text, sometimes I still don't say the right word because you have to really focus and you have to make sure you say exactly the right word. Sometimes you'll say something a little bit different. Um, instead of saying, although I might say all, then I have to go back. One time I said Judas instead of Jesus. <laughs> that was a really big mistake. So it's very helpful to have her listening along. So I'm bringing this up because even then I make mistakes when I'm actually reading from a script. The script is the book, The Crucifixion of the King of Glory. Well, last week I misspoke. And I'm, of course, that happens even more frequently because I'm not reading when we do this podcast. I'm not reading um, from a script. So last week, when I was descri describing the massive gate, the one that was considered the most expensive, the most valuable of all the gates in the temple complex, which was the Nicanor gate, I said brass a few times when I should, sh no, I said, yeah, I said brass a few times when I should have said bronze. And I, I went back and listened to the lesson. And twice I said, bronze, which is correct. And the other times I said brass, and it's not the same thing. Bronze and brass are not the same thing. And so I misspoke there. So I'm correcting myself officially here. And also, um, I think I said there are 17 Psalms of asc Ascent, but there are 15, and there's 15 steps that lead up to the Nicanor, Nicanor Gate. So there you go. We make mistakes. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why you will find that none of the Search the Scriptures podcasts, the original Search the Scriptures, I don't think this one either, have any, um, they're, they're not available in print. You know, they sometimes you can order or ask for a transcript. People were offering to pay to transcribe my lessons. And I said, no. Ancient Faith asked me if I would allow a transcript. And I said, no, because I can't, you know, let it go out in written form unless I've checked it to make sure I didn't misspeak, which often happens. So that's the reason. So I'm officially correcting that. It, the Nicanor Gate was bronze, not brass, and there were 15 steps of ascent in the semicircular steps that led up to the Nicanor Gate. So last week we were talking about the temple. This week we are going to discuss the Jewish priesthood, what went on in the temple. And also, if we have time, I have, I've been holding on to some of your questions. There were some random questions that were still outstanding that hadn't been addressed. And I'm hopeful that we will talk about that too. But in addition, besides the priesthood, because we already discussed the temple, now we're talking about the priesthood and the Levites. What was that about? What did they do? And after that, I would like to also discuss the cleansing of the temple, because this is something that's very confusing to people. And it is really important because the chief priests were the primary group responsible for the arrest and conviction of the Lord. And a lot of it had its roots, had its origin in the cleansing of the temple. And that's what I wanted to tell you about today, because there's a lot more that you don't know about. So we're going to fill in those blanks and give you your behind the scenes look into it. So hopefully a deeper understanding of Jewish priesthood and the cleansing of the temple. So let's go ahead and talk about priests. And this is a question that comes up sometimes, the question of our use of the term priest. Well, technically speaking, our the person that we call who is the head of our parish who we frequently call the priest, wasn't called a priest for a long, long time. The early church, if you look at the New Testament, this is one of the arguments that is made by some Protestants against uh, the idea of the church having rituals, because you won't find a reference to Christian priests in the New Testament, because it says instead, presbyters, there are deacons, presbyters, and bishops mentioned in the New Testament, not the word priest. And the word presbyter, presbyteros, is the word elder. So 
because of that, they said, well, there was no liturgy. There was no ritual in the early church of the New Testament. Well, of course, that is not true. But they did not use the term priest. Today, we use the term priest. Over time, that started to be used for the person who presided over the uh, sacrifice, the bloodless sacrifice of the divine liturgy, but not initially. It took a very long time before that was the term that was used. And the reason is the term priest in antiquity, whether a pagan priest or a Jewish priest, everybody was either, if you weren't Jewish, you were a pagan, you worshiped many gods, you were a polytheist. There wasn't anything in between. There weren't lots of different religions. There was in this region, basically two. You were either pagan and a polytheist, or you, you were Jewish. You worshiped the one God. But the person who, and, and everybody sacrificed animals. That's what a priest did. A priest sacrificed animals. That's all. But they were a different class of people. They were separate. They were apart from, set apart from ordinary people for this special sacred kind of task, but they didn't really do anything else other than offer sacrifices to God or the gods if it was a pagan priest. But nonetheless, they had a lot of status in the the religion of the place, wherever, you know, wherever you were. So when we think of our priests, we think of them not just doing the divine liturgy. If you think that's pretty much what your priest does, then you really don't understand all the things that your priest does all week long. I had, I think I've told you this story before, but I had um, one young lady in the parish say to me, boy, it must be nice to have your husband home so much. I said, what are you talking about? Because she only would see him on church on Sunday. My husband was gone from morning to night every single day. So the priest is very, very busy. He's got his responsibilities in the office with the bulletin or meeting people who stop by, taking care of correspondence. He goes and visits people in the hospital. He's counseling people. He's doing Bible studies. He's going to hospitals and meeting with shut-ins, visiting people in their businesses. You know, the priest has a lot of different duties. He has to prepare a sermon and his Bible study. So they're not just doing one thing, the divine liturgy. But in antiquity, the priest did that one thing, and that's it. The priests were not experts in the law of Moses. The priests were not teaching people about the law. That's not, they didn't have an education like that. They didn't do that sort of thing. They did one thing. They were responsible for the sacrifice of animals. And there were certain rituals that had to be followed. The certain sacrifice that had to be followed in a very specific way. So how did somebody become a priest? Well, first of all, you had to be born into the tribe of Levi. That was the priestly tribe. This is the tribe of Moses and Aaron. Now, perhaps you remember that after the Hebrews left Egypt and they were in the desert, there was a question as to who would become the first high priest of the Lord. Prior to this, you see people like Abraham and Noah and others in the um, book of Genesis, in the Old Testament, in the earlier histories, you see people sacrificing, offering sacrifices to the Lord. But by the time, after the Hebrews leave Egypt, the sacrifices to the Lord were stipulated. They were defined how you should offer sacrifice, what can be offered, in what manner, for what kinds of sins or offenses or occasions, and who was going to offer this sacrifice. So the question came up about who would become the first priest. And the story was that all of the, the leading men of Israel took their walking sticks, their staffs, and left it in the tabernacle, left them in the tabernacle overnight. And Aaron's walking stick budded. So that's called Aaron's rod, his walking stick. And it produced leaves and a flower. Today, we understand that is sort of symbolic of the virgin birth, that out of this dead piece of wood came a leaves and a flower. But it was seen as a sign that Aaron was chosen to be the first high priest. And so this is how it began. He was from the tribe of Levi. So the tribe of Levi was set aside to be the priestly tribe, to be the people who served the Lord, first in the tabernacle, then later in the temple, when a temple was finally built under Solomon. So the tribe of Levi had two branches. 
two parts, you could say. There was a priestly side, and then there was the Levite side. So you became a priest if you were born, you were a man, of course, you had to be a man. You, if you were a man who was born into the priestly branch of the tribe, then you became a priest. You didn't decide whether or not you wanted to be a priest. You were going to be a priest whether you wanted to or not. I suppose that most wanted to. I can't imagine that most men didn't want to. That you, it wasn't that you received a calling. You didn't feel like God, God had called you to be a priest. That's what we you know, expect today of a man who chooses the priesthood. He responds to a calling, but that wasn't the case then. Just as the same for anything else that your father did. Whatever your father did, if you were a boy, that's what you did. If your father was a stonemason, you learned to be a stonemason. If your father was a potter, you became a potter. If your father was a priest, you were a priest. If your father was a Levite, you were a Levite, that sort of thing. So you were born into that particular branch of the tribe of Levi. If you were a young man, when you were um, born into the priestly side, when you grew up, you became a priest. You didn't, you know, petition to become a priest or anything like this. Then the same thing with the Levite side. If you were a young man born into the Levite branch of the tribe of Levi, then you grew up, when you grew up, you became a Levite. That's how it worked. And, um, you, you, it's not like Levite didn't correspond to deacon or anything like that. And the, then the priests were like the highest. You didn't go from being a Levite to a priest. And if you were a priest, you couldn't be demoted down from priest to Levite. You remained in that role for your entire adult life. So the, tr the temple at Jerusalem was very, very complicated. It was a very complex operation. There were lots of different um, jobs that were required to be done in order to keep this huge complex running. So last time you got some idea of the scale of the size of the building and the numbers of worshipers who would come there. And you could think of all the things that were necessary to keep the place clean, to control the crowds, to have enough wood to burn all those sacrifices. Because remember that when we say sacrifice, we're talking about the burning of animals on that massive altar we described last week, an altar that was 25 feet up off the ground and 50 feet square, very huge. So you needed wood to burn those um, offerings. You needed lots of water because there was a lot of blood. And it, it's almost impossible for us to visualize what the temple was like. It was an open air courtyard for the most part, except for the sanctuary itself. These were big, big, big courtyards open to the air where animals were being slaughtered. Blood was flowing. Smoke was rising. It was a gory thing. Again, and, and not at all this quiet place of contemplation. When we go to a church, we speak in hushed voices. It's very quiet and very reverent. Well, there it was very noisy because there was a lot of activity. So it's nothing like um, the way we picture a church or a modern church. So just to give you an idea, let's start with the Levites. We'll talk about them. Now, scholars kind of are not sure. They disagree about how many priests or Levites were needed for the functioning of the temple. Estimates, estimates range between 10,000 Levites or 10, and 10,000 priests or up to 18,000 priests that were needed for running the temple. Now, all of them weren't there every day at the same time, except when there was a major pilgrim festival. Remember, there were three festivals which all Jewish adult men were required to attend if they possibly could. That would be Passover, Pentecost, uh, 50 days after the Passover, and then the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, which was in August or September. So the first two were in the spring and the last one was in the fall so or late summer. So um, most people think around 10,000, let's say between 10 and 18,000. We'll take 10,000 as a low number of Levites and priests. So... These groups, let's start with the Levites, they were divided into 24 groups. There are 52 weeks out of the year. 
they were divided into 24 different groups. And they each served in the temple two weeks out of the year. And of course, during those pilgrim festivals, those three pilgrim festivals. So they would come to the temple to serve for five weeks out of the year. Those two weeks, by the way, were not back to back. They were two different times of the year, plus the week of the big festivals. So five weeks out of the year, they were obligated to go to serve in the temple. And the Levites did a lot of the crowd control. They did all the I don't want to say grunt work, but a lot of the difficult work of the sort of practical work of running the temple operation, the crowd control, they were the doorkeepers. They would stand at that, you know, at the openings to make sure that a person didn't enter who wasn't, uh, you know, the right person. You had to be ritually clean. You could not be anything other than Jewish to enter into the temple courts. So they patrolled the grounds. The temple would shut down at night. They would shut all the doors. They were responsible for closing the doors. And at night, the Levites were sentries. They would patrol the grounds and make sure that everything was was safe and that there was no funny business going on there, no thievery or anything like this. So they were watchmen on the temple grounds and sentries. And one of the... One of the um, One of the interesting little facts I found out that's in the footnotes, one of the things I couldn't tell you if you listen to the audible version of this book is that that as the sentries, there was a supervisor, of course, who patrolled the area. And if he found that somebody had fallen asleep on guard duty, the the supervisor was allowed to wake the Levite up who had fallen asleep on guard duty by setting fire to his clothes. I thought that was funny. That made me laugh out loud. It's kind of horrific, but it was a pretty serious thing. You have to guard the temple and you can't fall asleep. And if you do fall asleep, your boss can light your clothes on fire. So that was a little bit of interesting information that I gleaned. And that's what I kind of like footnotes for that reason, because often there's interesting stuff that doesn't exactly belong in the text, but you can put it in the footnotes. So that's one of them. They also performed police functions because of the large crowds, because of the presence of a lot of money in the temple. There was a temple guard that was, that was manned by the Levites. And that was a lot of people and they had to be very well trained and very well equipped. These are the people who come to arrest Jesus at the gar- garden, but also before that, when they were uh, when they were given orders to arrest Jesus in the temple. These this is the group that was dispatched. Okay, so um, they also because they had this policing function. If the Sanhedrin ordered that someone be punished, like let's say they thought Jesus deserved to be punished the way St. Paul had been punished with 39 lashes, then they are the ones, the temple guards who are Levites, are the ones who would have carried out these kinds of punishments or other kinds of beatings as ordered by the Sanhedrin. So they would do other sort of minor things like cleaning or sweeping. They might help the priests with their vestments, carrying, uh, you know, uh, things like salt or hides or other sorts of things. So there was a lot of manual labor. Nothing, of course, was automated. All all kinds of uh, chores that were necessary. The most prized posi- pos- position among the Levites was that of a church or a church, a, a temple musician or singer. So the Levites formed a choir that would sing for, you know, sing the Psalms twice a day for the daily offerings to the Lord, which were twice a day, and also for special occasions like we talked about last time. We talked about the the Feast of, of Booths, where they would light those giant, giant um, lampstands in the court of the women, and the Levites would sing from the steps, the 15 steps leading up to the Nicanor Gate. That was considered very, very prestigious. And in order to serve in that capacity, and also in the priest, priestly capacity, if there was any question about your lineage, you had to prove your lineage and also that to ensure that you have the proper bloodline. If your, um, you would be disqualified if your mother or anybody in the family had been taken 
a prisoner or something like this. So there were certain very strict regulations regarding the bloodlines. So when I told you that there were, in fact, genealogies kept in the temple, this is how people, they were really necessary, especially for the priestly groups, because they had to very often had to prove that they came from the pure priestly stock. So um, the Levite choir and the Levite musicians would play, and that was considered the most prestigious position. So what kinds of instruments? Well, they played harps and they played cymbals and they blew trumpets and things like this. So those are the Levites. What about the priests? Oh, by the way, the Levites could not venture into the area that was reserved for priests alone. So, and by, and also, by the way, since they only served in the temple for five weeks out of the year, that means the rest of the time they had to be, you know, supporting themselves with their own work. So this was the case with the ordinary priests also. So the ordinary priests also numbered between 10,000, maybe, and perhaps as high as 18,000 ordinary priests who served in the temple. They were divided into 24 divisions, just like the um, Levites were. And they similarly served in the temple on a rotational basis. Everybody knew when it was time for their, them, their group to go to Jerusalem and serve in the temple. They did that twice a year. Again, just like the Levites, not back to back, but twice in the course of the year, along with all three required pilgrim festivals. And these um, groups are mentioned in the Old Testament, exactly the names of the different priestly groups, the 24 groups. And St. Luke mentions them or mentions the group that Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, belonged to the uh, division of Abijah uh, of the tribe of Levi, and that was his group. So they would go to the temple at, this, at the time that, that they were called to serve. And they would serve for one week, and then they would return home to their ordinary occupation, whatever that was. And the priests had different kinds of occupations. They could be farmers, and they could be fishermen. They could work a trade. Some of them were scribes. Most of them were not necessarily educated, and they certainly were not wealthy, but they had their own way of supporting themselves. They were supposed to receive um, some of the proceeds from the sacrifices that were offered. But as we will find out, that didn't always happen, especially at the, in the time of Christ. Most priests lived in or near Judea, er, near Jerusalem, in Judea, near Jerusalem, because it was easier to get to the temple when it was their turn. But some of them could live in Galilee, and apparently some of them did, because John, the, the evangelist, John, the son of Zebedee, um, was a priest. And he was, it tells us in his gospel, he was known to the high priest. And we discussed that when we did the gospel of John, that when he died, he was buried with the Jewish, the vestments of a Jewish priest. So um, this was possible and people thought that was impossible, but priests could work in Galilee as fishermen. They just had to be in Jerusalem five times a year. That's not so impossible to imagine. And priests also did other kinds of jobs. They were trained in, in working in, in metals, in rep all kinds of repairs and working in wood and stone. Anything that needed to be done in the court of the priests had to be done by priests because no one else could set foot into that space. So they also sometimes served as other functions in the temple, but they were trained to do all of these things, as I mentioned last time, to add to the gold embellishment of the entrance to the holy place, things like that. If, let's say, a door was broken or the silver was coming off of one of the silver doors that opened into the holy, to the um, the court of the priests, there had to be a priest to fix it. It couldn't be done. They couldn't bring in some tradesmen or craftsmen down from the city. Only a priest could enter into these sacred spaces. So the priests were supposed to receive a portion of the first fruits, a portion of the uh, sacrifices, the, some of the hides of all of, think of, think of all of those animals that were sacrificed, not just for festivals like Passover or Yom Kippur, but there were ordinary worshipers who brought animals 
to be sacrificed for a specific sin or just as an offering to the Lord or because they had given birth to their firstborn. There were lots of different occasions and people would bring an animal and then usually the animal was skinned. And so that that hide became very valuable. So they were supposed to receive a portion of that to compensate them for the fact that they weren't home working, supporting their family. So most of the priests were ordinary priests, like Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. They were not high ranking. They were not influential. They were not wealthy. They were just working men who came and served, you know, five weeks out of the year. The actual running of the temple, the administration of the temple, the management of the temple was reserved to the chief priests, and they are the ones who made their actual living from the temple. All of their money, all of their livelihood came from the temple. And those are the people who, whom Jesus offended and who were worried about the influence Jesus might have. So what did the priests do on a daily basis? Well, of course, there were sacrifices offered to the Lord twice daily, once in the morning and once in the afternoon. And there, the, the Lord was offered incense. He was offered a lamb. There was a food offering called a, and a baked meal offering. And there was also a morning purification of the altar. And in the evening, two priests carried wood to the altar, pr- presumably for the next day, On the Sabbath, three lambs were offered to the Lord twice a day, two bowls of incense, and 12 loaves of showbread were replaced in the holy place. So we read about this in the Gospel of Luke, how it fell by lot to Zacharias to go into the holy place to burn incense before the altar of the Lord, that that sort of thing. So, And as I mentioned, ordinary worshipers came and brought sacrifices. But priests did other things too. If somebody had leprosy, remember when the Lord cured the leper? He said, you know, go show yourself to the priests. If somebody claimed to have been cured of a skin disease, they would have to go to the temple at Jerusalem and have the priest examine them and and, uh, certify that they were no longer afflicted with this disease. There were other priests who would look at the wood. The wood that was offered for sacrifice had to be perfect, not just the animals. Priests had to had to uh, make sure that the animals being offered for sacrifice, they had to certify them as fit for sacrifice. They had to be perfect and without blemish. The wood that was being burnt also had to be perfect. It could not contain any insects because insects were unclean. So they had to examine the wood for the sacrifice. On Friday afternoon, right before sunset or, you know, half an hour before sunset, a priest would blow a silver trumpet from the highest point of the Temple Mount. So the whole city would be aware that sunset was about to happen and prepare for uh, the beginning of Sabbath. And then on Saturday at sunset, again, he blew a a trumpet to let everyone know that Sabbath was over. So there were many, many various functions that the priests, ordinary priests provided, uh, performed within the temple to keep this incredible institution functioning. And it required thousands of people on any given, in any given week. So let's take a break at this moment. When we return, we'll talk about the roles and activities and a corruption of the chief priests. Join me after the break. Dr. Constantino will be back in a moment, but the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. So here's a question for you. What does it mean to think orthodox? What are the unspoken and unexplored premises and presumptions underlying what Christians believe? Orthodox Christianity is based on preserving the mind of the early church, its phronima, Dr. Jeannie Constantino brings her more than 40 years experience as a professor, Bible teacher, and speaker to bear in explaining what the Orthodox phronema is, how it can be acquired, and how that phronema is expressed in true Orthodox theology, as practiced by those who are properly qualified by both training and a deep relationship with Christ. Thinking Orthodox. Now available at store.ancientfaith.com. That's store.ancientfaith.com. We are back.
back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantino. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. So the chief priests, how were they different from the ordinary priests? The chief priests in one respect were ordinary priests in that they didn't have any special rights or any responsibilities to offer certain sacrifices the way the high priest did. The high priest was in a class by himself. There were certain um, liturgical, we could say, ritual functions that could only be performed by the high priest. Chief priests were not like that. But they also had more um, responsibility and administrative authority over the ordinary priests. That's who the chief priests were. They were the ones who really ran the temple operation on a daily basis. And just as in the Jewish world, as well as in the pagan world, the priests, especially the chief priests, had a lot of authority and power and influence. They had a a lot of wealth also. They were highly respected, and they were drawn from a very small group of elite priestly families, and they kept the power within these little families. So the high priests were drawn, was, were really controlled for, from the time of Herod the Great. Only about four families, the, uh, Jewish families, controlled the high priesthood. And during the first century, almost all of the high priests were related to Annas, were sons of Annas or the son-in-law of Annas, Caiaphas. So they were very, very powerful, and they also controlled the chief priests, and they controlled and appointed people to various positions within the temple. So the chief priests were responsible for maintaining order and maintaining their positions because this is how they became wealthy. They were very closely connected to the Sanhedrin, to the Sadducees, to the high priests, and they were appointed to various types of positions within the temple, and this is what gave them power and authority. So because of this, they tended to want to keep everything very calm. They wanted to cooperate with Rome, and this is what is behind their, or motivating, one of the reasons for their motivation to have Jesus arrested, because they were the ones, the chief priests were the ones who were responsible for arresting and Jesus and basically having him put to death by Pilate. So what kinds of functions did the chief priests have? Well, as I mentioned, the Levites were guards and doorkeepers, and they helped with the opening and the closing of these doors, some of which were really massive, like that like that bronze Nicanor gate, the double door, leading that marked the separation between the court of the women and the, the rest of the court, the next big space, which was the temple court. So they, that, they needed, you know, there were about 200 Levites who would go around in the temple and close all the doors at night and secure the facility. But the chief priests had the keys to the doors and the chief priests were the ones who would, but the, no one priest had all the keys. They, there were seven different priests who had seven dif- different keys to open the various doors. And they all had to assemble together, especially for the inner courts. They all had to get together. No door could be opened until all seven were present. But also, they were the ones who were managing all the money, all the money that flowed into the temple, the the gifts, the tithes, the gold that came into the temple. They were the ones who arranged for the casting of lots uh, to decide what the what functions or what jobs the ordinary priests would do when they came to serve in the temple. They had to they were the ones who decided on which animals would be purchased and from whom, and the purchase of wood and salt, which was necessary for curing the hides, and the the production of the showbread and all of the incense that had to be purchased and the water that had to be arranged had to be pumped into the laver, that big brass receptacle or bronze receptacle that was in the court of the priests. Just because imagine the amount of water that was needed just to wash up after sacrifice, after sacrifice, after sacrifice, all of the um, animals that were being slaughtered in that space. And as I said, it's open to the sky above and it gets hot in that part of the world. So imagine all the water that was needed for cleaning the area, 
maintaining all the different gold utensils. All of this was the responsibility of the chief priest, not the physical action itself, but making sure that it was done, that it was accomplished, and also deciding who would do what job and also what would be purchased from whom. So because they were in charge of what we would call procurement, they also had a lot of influence. And you can imagine how many people would bribe them for um, to get these kinds of contracts to provide animals for sale or to approve this uh, or that type of a purchase. And so this is what, what led really ultimately to their corruption. There were also chief priestly families that were responsible for providing certain items, especially the showbread and the incense. It could only be purchased, it could be purchased only exclusively from one particular family, which meant they had a monopoly on this. So, of course, they became very, very wealthy. So, unfortunately, the chief priests abused their positions to enrich themselves and to um, maintain their power, particularly since they weren't necessarily born into that particular their family wasn't necessarily the correct family that should have held that position. I think I already told you this last week, but perhaps I haven't. The high priesthood had become corrupted uh, long before the time of Jesus. The high priests were chosen by the Romans and before them by Herod the Great. And before them, during the Hasmonean period, the Hasmoneans, who were an ordinary priestly family, not a high priestly family, and before them, they were chosen by the Seleucid dynasty, the, the Greek rulers who succeeded Alexander the Great. They chose the high priest, and they chose them by bribery. So even though the high priest did come from priestly lineage, and so did the chief priest, they didn't come from the right priestly family, high priestly family, they did not descend from the proper high priestly family. So a lot of corruption had already occurred in the centuries preceding the appearance of the Lord, but it had become much, much worse by the time the Lord appeared on the scene. And people, you know, because the temple was a place of tremendous wealth and power, since it was the only Jewish temple in the entire world, and all the money went went there, the ch chief priests and the high priests became extremely corrupt. And this is not just me as a Christian speaking, but first century Jewish sources, many, many early Jewish writings from the first century and from the second century and the third century describe the corruption of the chief priests. Among the things that happened is that the chief priests would send men, their servants, I suppose, with clubs to steal the tithes and the animal hides that had been given to the ordinary priests. So as I said, the ordinary priests could walk away from their period of time serving in the temple with some produce. They could come home with some animal hides, which, as I said, were very valuable. But there are accounts written by Jewish authors about how the chief priests were sending men to beat the ordinary priests and take away their hides. And, and literally, they were, became impoverished. Many of the ordinary priests were very, very poor because what they should have received from their service in the temple was stolen from them by men under the acting under the direction of the chief priests. So this was a serious problem. And this is one of the things that the Lord is reacting to when it comes to the cleansing of the temple. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Let's, okay. But before we get to that, Let's hear from Daniel, who is calling us from Tennessee. Is that right? Are you with us, Daniel? Yes, uh, right here. Very good. Well, welcome to Search the Scriptures, Daniel. Where do you live in Tennessee? I'm in Memphis. This is my first time tuning in. Wonderful. I'm so glad you're with us. Do you have a question well, for us or a comment? Uh, very quick, two questions, and I will hang up and, and listen. Um, yeah, unless you want me to stay on. Um, I'm concerned that when people say Judeo-Christian to refer mm -hmm. to morality, that that can get a bit muddled because 
there may be sects of Judaism that uh, put that say that this and that is all right when um, that may clash with Christian uh, mm-hmm. uh, Orthodox uh, ways. The other thing, and I'm not Orthodox, but I'm, I'm seeking. Uh, mm-hmm. The other thing, the other thing is why so many Jews. Um, I wish there was something I could do to open up their minds to Jesus being the Messiah, because mm-hmm. um, it. Uh, I, of course, I understand. May, maybe some reason is uh, that which was done by people that called themselves Christian, which weren't Christian. Um, it's all a muddle because, of course, Christianity came out of Judaism, of course. But not everybody that said that one was Christian would have acted as such. Anyway, uh, I will uh, hang on, or I can hang up, whichever you wish. Well, it's it's up to you, but we'll go ahead and talk about these two, about Judeo-Christian morality. I think you're right about that, because our values are not the same as those of the Jews in certain respects. Um, There are things that that they allow, that Judaism allows, such as revenge. We don't allow that. Jesus is opposed to that. And there are a few other things. I think when people talk about that, they're thinking in terms of maybe the Ten Commandments and the general structure of morality that most people agree on. But I would agree with you. There are some parallels. Yes, of course, because we worship the same God. We worship the one God. But um, you're right about that. So when we talk about Judeo-Christian morality, I think they're talking in in something separate from other types, obviously, other world religions. So we do have, as you mentioned, a common foundation. We have our foundation in Judaism. So we do have some of the ideas that come from Judaism, but but the Christian faith goes far beyond Judaism, and this is why the Lord was opposed by the Jews of his time, because he he said, well, it was said before, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, do not even look at a woman with lust, right? So Judaism retains that character of um, focusing on what you actually do as opposed to what you're thinking. So Christian, the Christian morality really holds to a much higher standard. But as you mentioned in your second question, that has not always been observed by Christians who have really unfortunately diminished the name of Christ in, um, in the world because they have sometimes persecuted Jews. And this is one of the main reasons why Jews can't accept Jesus today. There are a couple of reasons. First, yes, they have suffered persecution by many so-called Christians supposedly acting in the name of Christ who persecuted the Jews. That has really happened. It's unfortunate, and because of that, a lot of Jews don't want anything to do about Je- with Jesus, and they consider any Jew who accepts Jesus to basically be a traitor to their own people. That's one reason. Another reason is because the Christians were opposed by the Jews when the when we as a church were just beginning the Jew, the Jews were fighting us, and they were the majority. They they far outnumbered us. They wanted to dismiss Je- the claims about Jesus. That Christians were making claims about Jesus that he was the Messiah. So they have many negative things that they say about Jesus in their writings, in the Talmud, for example, and um, the the Talmud says very nasty things about Jesus. And also the name that they use for him, this is also in the footnotes of the book, the name that they use for Jesus in the Talmud is Yeshu. His Jewish name is Yeshua, which is Joshua. But they don't call him that. They call him Yeshu. And the letters of that name stand for, may his name and memory be obliterated. So they never say his name ever. And um, so there's unfo- that's an unfortunate reality. And they are taught from the time that they're very, very young, that Jesus was evil and a false prophet. And it's very difficult for Jews to overcome that and the pressure by their families and society to believe in Jesus and to accept, have faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So I think that's the main reason, Daniel. Do you have anything to add? Okay, well, thanks for calling in. Were you 
Which book were you talking about? I'm with, talking about the book that we're discussing tonight, The Crucifixion of the King of Glory, which will be published in about two months by Ancient Faith Press. I'm talking about might, tonight. Might you be able to put that into audio format? So yes, we're. I'm recording it right now. Blind. Oh, absolutely. Oh, well, I you. I am recording that at, in these these weeks. I am recording that in audible format, so you will be able to listen to it. Well, thank okay? you. Well, do well, thank take you. care and God bless you. Thank you. You too, Daniel. Thanks for calling in. God bless you too. Okay, so that was fun hearing from Daniel. So we're talking about the cleansing of the temple and the 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 role that that played in connection with the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus, because this was a very significant event that led to the arrest of Jesus. And if you think about it, you will realize that that's the first charge that comes up at his trial. When they are calling witnesses, if you recall, it says, and then two came forward and said, this man said, I will destroy the temple of God and build it up in three days. Remember that line from his trial? So it is with that testimony that Jesus was a threat to the temple that the Jewish trial begins. And this is when Caiaphas begins questioning Jesus. So this whole event, what we call the cleansing of the temple, is critical and crucial to our understanding of what happened to Jesus and why. So we've already learned about the corruption of the chief priests <clears throat> and the high priests. So let's go ahead and turn our attention to the cleansing of the temple. This event is mentioned in all four Gospels, which should also tell you that it was very important. And it is mentioned in connection with the arrest and crucifixion of the Lord. For Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it happened during the last week of Jesus's life. And in John's gospel, however, it's early on. It is in chapter two of John's gospel. And this has led to some debate as to when, when did this happen? Was it early in Jesus's ministry or was it later in the ministry? It actually doesn't matter because regardless of when it happened, it was a very dramatic event and it di directly affected Christ. It became one of the catalysts for his arrest and his trial. So um, I think I'm inclined to believe that it happened early, that John is giving us, because John John's gospel in general has a much more accurate chronology for one simple reason. In John's gospel, Jesus is traveling all around. He's in Samaria, he's up in Galilee, he's back down in Judea, he's on the other side of the Jordan, and John really describes his travels specifically and the chronology of events in a way that Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not. So if you think about it, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have one trip to Jerusalem. They, they describe one trip by Jesus to Jerusalem, when we know he must have had many trips to Jerusalem, because as a Jewish man, he was required to attend at least three times a year. So he, we know that he made multiple trips to Jerusalem, and John's gospel describes multiple trips to Jerusalem. But the synoptics kind of simplified everything, and they really only describe that one final trip to Jerusalem when the Lord is arrested. So, of course, they're going to tell about the cleansing of the temple at that time. So they're not concerned with whether or not it happened a year before or two years before or that year. It's ultimately not important. What's important is what Jesus did and what he said and the alarm that it created among the chief priests. So when we think about the cleansing of the temple, this is often misunderstood by Christians or they're kind of uncomfortable with <laughs> the cleansing of the temple because, you know, sometimes people say, well, Jesus got mad. You know, if we talk about anger and how you're not supposed to get angry, well, Jesus got mad at the cleansing of the temple. Like Jesus saw things he had never seen before for some reason. He's irritated that day, and he decides to overthrow the tables and drive out the animals. In other words, Jesus lost his temper and got mad. That's not what happened, because that's what we would do. That's sin. When we lose our temper, we lose control. So we can't say that. Jesus didn't suddenly lose his temper and get mad and start trashing the temple. So you have to get that out of your head. 
So you can never use that as an excuse for you losing your temper. So if you lose your temper, don't say, well, Jesus got mad too, and he cleansed the temple. No, obviously not. Um, What happened was he does make a statement. The cleansing of the temple is a statement. It is also a prophecy. It is a symbolic prophetic act. Now, prophetic meaning that Jesus was foretelling the future destruction of the temple. That's how the most interpreters understand it. And the fact that worship of the temple would be replaced by the worship through Jesus Christ. And there are lots of hints of this, but it doesn't say that in the it doesn't tell us what it means when we read the gospel account of it. This is why people don't understand it. So, as we mentioned last week, at the royal stoa, the the worshipers would go up to the top of the temple mount. And remember, the whole top of the temple mount was rimmed by colonnades. And one uh, colonnade set of columns that was covered with a very high roof, but it was a row of four columns was called the royal stoa. And within those four columns that created these three corridors, that's where animals were sold for sacrifice, and that's where the money changers sat and exchanged the money. So let's talk about also the currency exchange. We should talk about that. Why was that happening there? But the point is that Jesus was protesting, and this is what it seems also from his words, by his action, Jesus was passing judgment on the commercialization of the temple, on the corruption of the temple by the chief priests, and also indicating that worship at the temple would cease because it would be destroyed in the relatively near future. Everything that took place on the temple mount was sanctioned by the high priests and the chief priests. If you wanted to have a little booth, in the royal stoa to change money or to sell animals, obviously you had to have permission to be there. Who controlled that? The chief priests. What did they get for letting you have your little booth? They got a kickback. So this is how they became wealthy. They controlled all of the finances of the temple. So they profited from this. So let's talk about the money changers, because this is also something else, which is not really well understood. So, all right, let's, let's see if we can, but before we get to that, we have another caller, but before we answer about currency exchange, let's see if we can answer this call from Theodore before our break. Theodore, where are you, Theodora, where are you coming, calling from? Hi there. I'm calling from Florida. Well, welcome to search the scriptures, Theodore. What is your question or comment? Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks for all the work you do. We, uh, we all really appreciate it. I, I kind of had two questions. The first was, uh, if there's any validity to the stories of a, an additional temple being built in either Egypt or Ethiopia. I know some Ethiopians have stories about the Ark still mm-hmm. residing there. And uh, the second one was, earlier you said that Jesus was known as Joshua. And I was just wondering, since Joshua is easy enough to pronounce, why don't we call him Joshua? Why do we call him Jesus? (laughs) That's a good question. Well, actually, in the New Testament and Old Testament, Jesus' name in Greek is Jesus, Jesus. In the Old Testament, in the Septuagint, it's also Jesus. That's why if you ever read the Fathers of the Church and they're talking about Joshua, they'll say sometimes it's translated as Jesus you know, and this is why, but then they'll say the son of, and they will say who he is. So it is the same, how it ended up becoming Jesus and not Joshua. I can't tell you, except that I guess they, when they translated, and maybe it, maybe it's from the fact that um, most of the English Bibles are translated from Hebrew and Hebrew, it's Yeshua for Joshua. And they continue, they just follow the Greek Jesus for the New Testament. That's all I can think of, but it is the same exact name. Okay. So, yeah, but about, what was your other question? About, um, oh yeah, the other temple. Know. Yes, there is there there was supposedly some other location in Egypt 
where some of the Jews were offering sacrifice. And if there were some in Ethiopia who were offering sacrifice, it wouldn't have been accepted. I mean, it's not an, a, recognized officially as a temple. So I remember this discussion when I was a, you know, a graduate student, but you can't say that that's an actual recognized temple. Somebody, you couldn't stop a person if, say, they wanted to sacrifice an animal to the Lord. I suppose they could. They weren't supposed to, but that doesn't make, just like today, if you decide to stay home one day and just take out some bread and wine and offer the liturgy, you can do it, but that doesn't make it legitimate. You see what I'm saying? So there were these other, at least one place where some Jews in exile or in Alexandria or Egypt or elsewhere in Egypt uh, offered sacrifices, but that didn't make it a legitimate temple. It, I understand. And it's uh, almost... Is there, any, is there yeah. any possibility that the Ark may be in Ethiopia? <laughs> I, You know what? I don't know. The Ethiopians aren't letting anybody look at it. And uh, that that kind of, I'm not so sure why. We have a lot of Ethiopians who listen to this. They're very proud of the fact that they say they have the Ark of the Covenant. I've never really studied that. I don't know their history, why they say they have it. I know they say that it was sent there to be protected. But there is a very long tradition of Judaism in Ethiopia, and they have a unique form of Orthodox Christianity there that's very, very ancient. So, you know, who knows? If they do, it's really something. But if they, they don't want anybody to look at it because they I'm sure they're afraid that it will be taken. So I, I don't blame them. So they say that they have it. I don't know. I can't say for sure. Thank you. I wish I, I wish I knew today. myself. God Thank you. God bless you too, Theodore. Thanks for calling. Okay, let's take a break at this moment. When we come back, we're going to talk about why there were money changers up there at the top of the Temple Mount. So join me after the break. Dr. Constantinou will be back in a moment, but the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. This is an Ancient Faith Radio public service announcement. Winter Camp at Antiochian Village will run this year from February 18th to the 21st, 2022. Invited to attend are 7th through 12th graders and the event will function as a spiritual recharge in the middle of the school year. Speakers include Father Nicholas Belcher and Elisa Kiritsis. Antiochian Village is located in Ligonier, Pennsylvania, and more information about the camp can be found at avcamp.org. Occurring simultaneously at the village is the Ancient Faith Marriage Retreat. Parents are encouraged to drop their kids off at camp and then participate in what is sure to be an inspiring and edifying conference. Father Nicholas and Dr. Roxanne Lowe will lead the retreat, and more information about it can be found at store.ancientfaith.com slash events. This has been a public service announcement of Ancient Faith Radio. We are back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. So why were there money changers? We think of them as bankers, but really they're not bankers. They were really a necessity. Money changers um, were at the Temple Mount because Jews came from all over the Roman world with to the Temple Mount, and they had a variety of coins. It was not like, even though it's the Roman Empire, you might think that there was a consistency in the coinage, but that's not the case at all because... Some areas were provinces like Judea. Some cities uh, were independent cities like in the Decapolis, or some cities were Roman colonies. There were cities that were, or there were kingdoms that were satellite kingdoms under the umbrella of Rome. So all of these different places had their own coinage. And even local rulers like Pontius Pilate minted his own coins. So there were lots of different kinds of coins. And because of that, there were different weights. There was different purity of the metals. And if you were coming to purchase an animal on the, temp the Temple Mount, you had to use that. You had to purchase that animal with the approved coin of the temple. And that was the silver shekel of Tyre, T-Y-R-E, the city on the coast. And by the way, that was a pagan city, but that was the approved coinage of the temple. 
And the reason for that is because the, especially the silver coins were of different purity. So the silver uh, coins of Tyre had a much better, higher uh, percentage of silver. They were 94% silver, whereas Roman silver coins were only 80% silver. So what the, the um, temple treasury and the chief priests who ran the treasury, they didn't want to have to bother with all of these different kinds of coins from different places and different other, if they weren't silver, they were bronze coins usually. The everyday sort of pocket change that people use to buy ordinary items was in bronze. And that was just, there would just be too many. They would be overwhelmed by the different sizes and different amounts and different uh, minting from different places. So everything had to be changed over to temple currency. And uh, that's what the money changers were for. And they took a percentage, just like if you were to travel to to Europe or Australia and you Canada, you want to change your money, you're going to lose something in the exchange. So they got something from the exchange. It was usually between 4 and 8%. But we also know from Jewish writers of this period that sometimes they were cheating people with unfair weights and measures. So this was also kind of well known. And also the, there was a sort of an, people were taking advantage of the, their position selling the sacrificial animals to gouge the people. So Jesus was objecting to the commercialization of the temple, but also the fact that they were taking advantage of the, the worshipers. Now, you might say, well, somebody had to sell the animals. Remember, these animals had to be approved by the priests, and you could only use this type of coin, the coins from Tyre, for the uh, any purchases or to pay your temple tax, things like that. The shekels, it had to be silver shekels, but it had to be in the coins of Tyre if you're paying it at the temple. So you needed that kind of a service, but it didn't have to be done on the temple mount. That could have been done, that could have been done down below, in the valley below, where there were all these other shops selling all kinds of other things. There could have been animals for sale down there. You didn't have to do that on the temple mount. So this is something that the Lord is uh, objecting to. But as I mentioned, he wasn't the only person to object to the commercialization of the temple or the fact that there was a lot of dishonest dishonest practices and cheating of worshipers that was done. So it was very impious. It cheapened the temple. It reduced it to a place of commerce. So when the Lord goes and cleanses the temple, he quotes the scriptures and says, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the ro word for robbers is listis. So a robber is not uh, is not the same as a burglar. So some, sometimes if your house gets burglarized, you say, I was robbed. No, you weren't robbed. This is me. This is the lawyer talking. That's not a robbery. A robbery is when something is forcibly taken from you by violence or by threat of violence from your person. So burg when you break into somebody's house, that's a burglary. That's not a robbery. So robbery is what the chief priests were actually doing when they were forcibly taking the agricultural tithes and the animal hides from the ordinary priests for their own enrichment. There were many Jewish writings from this era that describe the high priests and the chief priests as robbers, and that's the word that was being used at the time. So Jesus is reacting to to this as well. And it was, so it was Jesus's statement that this is not appropriate for the temple, which is the house of the Lord. So this is not an angry outburst. This is not Jesus losing control. This is not righteous indignation. This is a symbolic act. He knew that this wasn't going to change. They weren't going to stop selling animals on the Temple Mount or changing money on the Temple Mount. He was making a statement, and this is something that we remember to this day, and we talk about to this day because there's something much deeper involved here. He was, by the way, he also was not denouncing formal temple worship or anything like this. He is affirming the sanctity of the temple. So some people say, yeah, Jesus was against ritual worship, right? They criticize us for having liturgical worship because Jesus 
overturned the in, t- tables of the money changers and the people who sold the animals. So they assumed that Jesus was opposed to ritual worship. No, he's not. He was opposed to people taking advantage of worshipers and profiting or being on the temple mount for their own personal profit. Uh, he was not opposing ritual itself. He was not suggesting that it's an empty formality. In fact, he is affirming that this temple was a holy place. He calls it his father's house. So why did Jesus choose to cleanse the temple now? As I mentioned, it's a symbolic act. And he told others that in someday that temple will no longer be standing. Remember, we talked about that. He totally shocked his disciples when he said there won't even be one stone left upon another. And he said to the Samaritan woman that the time is coming, the hour is coming, uh, and now is when people will worship God in spirit and in truth. Neither here in Samaria, nor there in Jerusalem will people worship the Lord, but they will worship him in spirit and in truth. So by these words and by his actions, the Lord was telling us that in the future, animal sacrifice would come to an end. There would be a new law, a new way of worshiping God. And this is what Christianity brought. This is what the church brought, what we call spiritual worship. Logiki latria. And this is a word, this is a phrase that's from the New Testament. It's from the writings of Paul. Logiki latria. And sometimes you hear this word in the prayers of the Orthodox Church, but because it's translated differently in English in lots of different ways, you don't necessarily recognize that this is what it's saying. But sometimes it's translated as spiritual worship or rational worship. Um I'm trying to think of how else it's tra- because logos could be rational or spiritual, um, but whatever, however it's translated into English, it, it means that Jesus was replacing the worship of the Lord and changing things over. He will change, bring about this change, so that we will no no longer worship the Lord with animals, with the blood of irrational animals, but we will offer spiritual worship, reasonable worship, that's another term, logical worship, rational worship for the Lord. In other words, not we won't worship God with the blood of animals. So Christians never sacrificed animals as part of their rituals. And this is something which came about because the Lord sacrificed himself on the cross. And this is connected to the, the cleansing of the temple. So This action of the Lord overturning the tables of the money changers and releasing all these sacrificial animals, you can imagine the chaos that ensued from this act. This made the temple authorities very, very nervous. Now, the pious, ordinary priests, the ones who were getting beaten up by the servants of the chief priests, they probably approved of Jesus's action. But the chief priests became the primary faction that orchestrated his death. And they were worried because his actions here created a lot of instability. He challenged their authority. And as I mentioned, when he finally gets arrested, this is the thing that is raised at his trial above, uh, before anything else. No, before the chief, before the high priest asked him if he's the Messiah, this is the charge that is made. This man said, I will destroy the temple of God. And in three days, uh, raise it up again. Now, of course, He was not really talking about the temple, but let's set that aside for a minute. His actions were seen as a direct challenge to the chief priests who knew that they were corrupt, right? But they didn't care because they believed that they were doing very well with this. So he was, they they were concerned because Jesus got this phenomenal welcome into the city of Jerusalem. People regarded him at least as a prophet, if not more than that, if not as the Messiah. And they were very concerned that he was a threat to their this, their position, their places of power and position and influence and money. They were extremely corrupt. And as I said, there are first century and second century, third century Jewish sources that talk about the corruption of the high priests and the chief priests during this period. So it is this threat that Jesus posed to the, the, the temple existence of the temple and to their management of it that made them very nervous about him. 
So after he cleansed the temple, they said, what sign do you have to show us for doing this? In other words, they are saying, by whose authority? How, how can you do this? What right gives you the right to do this? And when they ask him for a sign, by that they say, show us a miracle, that you have the right to do this. What did he say? Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, notice how that's different than the statement that is made by the false witnesses at Jesus' trial. So when we hear it in church, these, the, the false witnesses said that Jesus said, this man said, I will destroy the temple of God and in three days raise it up. That's not what Jesus said. He didn't say he was going to destroy the temple. He said they are going to destroy him. He said in John's gospel, it tells us, Jesus said, destroy this temple, referring to himself, and in three days I will raise it up. We know that they did not understand it. We know that they thought he was referring to the buildings, the structures of the temple, because they say it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? They realized that he wasn't speaking about the actual structures of the temple. And by the way, when they say 46 years, they were talking about since the program that Herod the Great had begun to enlarge and beautify the temple, that had been going on for 46 years, and it wasn't even close to being finished. He did not threaten to destroy the temple. He was speaking to them, knowing full well that they wanted to destroy him. And this is what, because they, and Jesus was saying that he knew that his actions that day would eventually result in his death. And that would be the first charge brought against him at his trial, because the chief priests were the ones who had the financial interest in preserving the temple. That was the source of their power, their authority, their money, that they they were the ones who orchestrated the arrest of Jesus. They're the ones who met together after the raising of Lazarus and decided to put Jesus to death. They're the ones who gave money to Jews, Judas. It is the chief priests who sent the temple guards to arrest Jesus. It is the chief priests who put him on trial before the Sanhedrin. It is the chief priests who take him to Pilate, who demand that Pilate crucify him. It is the chief priests who tell the mob to shout for Barabbas. And it is even the chief priests who ask Pilate for a guard to be placed at the tomb. So even though we're accustomed to thinking about the Pharisees as the primary opponents of Jesus, and they were primarily in Galilee, it is this group. It is the chief priests and their connection with the temple that is the primary catalyst for the, for the arrest and execution of Jesus of Nazareth. So he cleanses the temple. And then they surround him, and they're saying to him, by what uh, authority do you do this? Um, give, show us a sign. But what sign can you give us for doing this? And Jesus doesn't really defend himself. He just says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And John the evangelist tells us that he was speaking of the temple of his body. So the three days reference is a reference to the resurrection. So now let's talk about why Jesus talked about his body as a temple. And what does that have to do with the temple at Jerusalem? The temple in Jerusalem was considered the presence of God on earth. What Jesus was saying is that it is no longer the temple that's the presence of God on earth, but he was the presence of God on earth. He was the living temple of God that he was God who had taken flesh and is now literally among them. And it is they that it is they who would destroy the temple, but the temple that they would destroy, ultimately the Jewish leaders were responsible for the destruction of the temple because of their corruption, because of their extreme corruption. This leads to the Jewish war. It leads to a revolt by the ordinary Jewish people. So it is really the Jewish leaders who's, corruption led to the destruction of the temple. And by the way, that is recognized by Jews today as, as what is the reason why God allowed the temple to be destroyed for, for the most part. But the point is that God himself was present on earth in the temple. 
But now, with the incarnation, with the presence of Jesus Christ, God was present in a different way, physically. So when St. John writes, and the Word became flesh and tented among us, he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, he's saying that the presence of Jesus Christ on earth is the, basically replaces the presence of the temple which, and the importance of the temple. Because remember, to worship God and to experience the presence of God on earth, you had to go to the temple. There was only one Jewish temple in the entire world. But now the presence of God is on earth in a unique way, in the flesh, in the body, in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus was indicating by the cleansing of the temple that, and by his statements to people like the Samaritan woman, that worship of the Lord would no longer be centered at the temple in the future. Because right now, if you wanted to be in the presence of God, if you wanted to really worship the Lord, you had to do it with the blood of an animal, and you had to go to Jerusalem to do that. There was only one place in the whole world. And by the way, who could offer a sacrifice? If you believed in the, in the one God, of the God of Abraham, and you weren't Jewish, or you weren't ritually pure, you couldn't offer a sacrifice. Oh, it was very restricted. And by the way, only certain people who were born into the tribe of Levi, who were born into the priestly branch of the tribe, they were the ones who could offer sacrifice, not anybody else. So the temple of Jesus's body would in the future become the body through which the temple, through which the faithful would commune with God spiritually in every place in the world. So can you see how the temple of Jesus's body has replaced the Jewish temple? We worship God anywhere in the world, and we worship God spiritually, in spirit and in truth. The whole world has been sanctified by the presence of God on earth. And by the way, we don't worship, so we don't worship with the blood of animals. This was foretold by the prophet Jeremiah, and this is what the Lord was referring to when at the Last Supper he instituted Holy Communion. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant. So the prophet Jeremiah foretold that in the future there would be a new covenant. This is in chapter 31 of Jeremiah. There will be a new covenant, not like the one I made. This is God speaking. I will give you a new covenant, not like the one I made with your forefathers on Mount Sinai. I will bring you a new covenant in which the law will be written on your hearts. Does that sound familiar? That's what St. Paul is talking about when he talks about the circumcision of the heart or the law being written on our hearts. So there would be, that was foretold in the Jewish scriptures. It's still there for the Jews that there will be a new covenant to replace the covenant on Mount Sinai. And it won't be based on the blood of animals and it won't be based on following rituals of purity. That's what Jesus is signifying when he cleanses the temple. And we recognize that now. So when we go to church, we receive Jesus in the flesh, right? In Holy Communion. And this is what he replaced. The, the presence of God is with us on earth. Not only then when Jesus was physically walking the earth as a man, but also today when we receive him. And we are sanctified through this. And this this practice of Holy Communion can take place anywhere in the world and does take place at any time and virtually in almost any place in the world by all kinds of different people. You don't have to belong to a specific race. You don't have to engage in ritual purity. All of those restrictions were done away with by the Lord. So he said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. So it is the death and resurrection of the Lord, the destruction of his body by the chief priests, the mangling of his flesh. When Jesus says, this is my body, which is broken for you, his body was really broken. And this is my blood, which is poured out for you. His blood was shed for us. And that's what we receive at Holy Communion. That's the new covenant. It is not the blood of animals. So that the, the worship of the Lord with the blood of animals came to an end with the destruction of the temple. And Jesus was foretelling that. 
But at the time, no one understood that. Well, I have a few minutes left in our discussion tonight. So let's go ahead and talk about, um, I've got a couple quick questions. Uh, first of all, here's one from Anonymous. Dear Dr. Jeannie, it is related to the temple. The reason I am writing to you is actually related to the mother of our Lord, St. Mary. During this time of year, I always wondered how was her life as a typical Israelite girl growing up after she was dedicated to the temple? Also, I'm wondering what it meant being dedicated to the temple at three years old. What did that actually look like? Was the three-year-old child left there? Did the parents pick up the child on weekends? Where in the temple was the child located? Was the temple like a dorm for children? Who were the people taking care of the child or children? What was their daily routine? After being dedicated to the temple, did St. Mary ever meet her parents again? Did St. Mary ever meet her relatives? She knew of her relative Elizabeth, and she went to visit her and live with her for three months. Does this mean that St. Mary's relatives would visit her at the temple? What was the tradition when a girl who was dedicated to the temple reached puberty and her period started? Was she still allowed to live in the temple? That's signed anonymous. That's a lot of questions, anonymous, but I'm going to do the best to answer to answer you about them. First of all, this was a very rare thing. When a, a woman gave birth to her firstborn, you either that because the, all the firstborn belong to God. Remember, that's like the first fruits, the first of the animals, and also the firstborn children belong to God. That's from the Old Testament. So if you want to keep your child, so you're supposed to take your child to the temple and dedicate it to God. Or in the alternative, you could offer a sacrifice. And then at the 40 days for boys or 80 days for girls, you could offer the sacrifice and you can take the baby home with you. So you offer the sacrifice to the Lord instead. Most people offered the sacrifice. Very rarely did people leave their child at the temple. But we know that that did happen. The most famous other example I can think of is Samuel, whose, whose mother had made a vow to dedicate him to the Lord. And so she did not offer that sacrifice of the firstborn. That's Hannah in the book of Samuel. And instead, she kept him until he was three years old, and then she brought him to the tabernacle, and she left him in the care of the high priest, uh, Eli. So uh, was the three-year-old child left here? there? Yes. Um, did they pick up the child on weekends? No, I'm sure they did not. Where in the temple was located? So I don't think that they actually lived in the temple. As I described it, they couldn't have done that, and they probably wouldn't have done that. There would have been um, there were a lot of people who lived. Think about those thousands of priests who came every uh, week for their, their rotation changed. They had to have lodging someplace. So there are a lot of things about this that we don't know. We simply don't have that information. But certainly they would have had lodging for these children, whoever was dedicated to the temple, nearby the temple, and they would have gone to the temple every day. But there was no, there were no dormitories or anything like that on the Temple Mount that we know about. So who was taking care of them? I'm sure there were simple other people like, you know, we have this prophetess Anna that we hear about in the Gospel of Luke, who was, that was said, was continually in the temple. That doesn't mean she slept there. It just means that all day long she was there. So, um, what was their daily routine? We don't really know. They were probably going there for the prayers twice uh, a day, the daily offerings of the Lord and for all of this, uh, all of the feast days. And I'm sure they were given chores to do. We do know that there were girls who wove the temple curtain. And so there is kind of a tradition that St. Mary wove the temple curtain that was torn. I'm not sure if she wove that actual curtain because the curtain was changed every uh, year or so, a couple, or some people say a couple times a year. So, but she would have, that's a kind of job that women and girls did. So this is something that she would have done. And ma'am, I don't, I don't like to speculate. It's not good as a theologian to speculate, but sometimes I think about the, the, um, the robe of the Lord, the tunic that the Lord wore that was seamless would require an expert weaver. So I think, and we, she's depicted this way in the icons as, you know, with a spindle and she's spinning thread as she, when she, the angel Gabriel comes to her. So I'm sure that she did this kind of work and that's probably very likely. Did she ever see her parents again? Well, they were quite elderly. We don't really know, you know, how soon after this that they died. 
Um, did she ever meet her relatives? He may, she might have said, I mean, they were coming to the temple, so she might have seen them at this time. We don't really know. Um, what was the tradition? Was she allowed when she reached puberty and her period started? Well, she wasn't living in the temple, so that wasn't so much of an issue. But when she reached puberty, they would definitely arrange for her to get married because the idea of a consecrated virgin, somebody who maintained their virginity their whole life, was not part of Judaism. So they wouldn't have considered her. This is one of the things that's wrong with the Proto-Evangelium of James, which you know presents Mary as... Um, everybody knows she's going to be the mother of the Messiah. So there was a great rejoicing when she comes to the temple, when she's three years old, this kind of thing. No, nobody knew that Jesus was the Messiah. Nobody knew that Mary was going to be the mother of the Messiah. She was just an ordinary girl whose parents dedicated her to the Lord. And I think that that was a very few people, very few children in general would have done that, would have been dedicated to the Lord, especially girls. But it did happen, and uh, she didn't live probably in the temple. I know this probably upsets people who think that I'm not, um, you know, following the tradition of the church, which was that she lived in the Holy of Holies. Well, if you wish to believe that, there's nothing wrong with that. But that, um, that the, what that is trying to tell us is about her sanctity, and more than just, it's not important that she lived in the Holy of Holies, but that she became the Holy of Holies, that she became the person who contained God in her womb. She is the Holy of Holies because the uncontainable God was contained within the womb of Mary. And that's much more sanctifying than, than the holy place, than that empty windowless room, the Holy of Holies. So unfortunately, you know, the, I'll, I'll, I'll say something else here, which I've, I've talked about this before, but again, somebody recently asked me the same question about, uh, about this tradition of Mary living in the Holy of Holies and where we get this information from. And she wrote to me because her priest said, we get this information from the Apocrypha, from the Proto-Evangelium of James. So, I wish priests would stop saying that because we know that there are things in the Proto-Evangelium of James that contradict the canonical scriptures. Zacharias was not high priest. We know that for a fact. We also know that from historical records. But there is, um, but so that we don't, and I wish the priests would say, we know these things. We know who her parents were. We know that she was dedicated to the temple. That was part of the oral tradition of the church. Eventually, somebody took that oral tradition and elaborated upon it and added all kinds of other fanciful ideas. Now, the church embraced some of those ideas, not necessarily because they historically happened, if you wish to believe she actually lived in the Holy of Holies, there's nothing wrong with that. If that bothers you and you, you can't accept that, that's fine too. You don't have to believe that. What is important is what that says about her, about her sanctity. That's what the church is really trying to say by the hymnology, by the iconography of the church. It's a reflection of the sanctity of Mary as being in this holy place on a continual basis every day and herself becoming so sanctified that she was chosen to contain the uncontainable God in her own body. So this is really what the church is getting at. So I wish priests would not say we get this information from the Apocrypha because the Apocrypha were rejected by the church as false writings. It is not written by James. It's not based on any eyewitness testimony because it's too late. It's more than 100 years after the death of the Theotokos, and there were, there were no eyewitnesses left when this was written, and we can tell that it contains many, many errors. So it's a big problem to me speaking as a theologian. I'm very uncomfortable with priests saying that we get information about the Virgin Mary from false writings. You see, this is a problem. And no, none, of the, none, none of the fathers of the Church ever tell us to read those writings. None of the fathers of the church ever tell us to read the Apocrypha. And people are curious about the Virgin Mary. This last emailer who wrote to me said, I want to know more about the life of the Virgin. I want to, where can I find out about it? Well, guess what? You can't. 
except through these false writings. And then sometimes people ask me, well, what parts are true and what parts are false? False. Well, a lot of things we know are false because they contradict the Gospels, but other things we don't know. So why are you meddling? I, I will tell you what St. Simeon, the new theologian, said. You know what he said? He said, search the scriptures. Do not meddle. Do not seek to inquire into things that have not been revealed to us. So I am of this position, and I think this is a very orthodox stance to take. We don't know very much about the life of the Virgin. We know almost nothing. Rather than meddling into it and trying to find out about these things, which we can never know about, let us focus upon what is spiritually useful for us. Let's read the lives of the saints. Let's read the scriptures. And let's try to imitate the Virgin Mary rather than trying to find out details about her life, which we will never know. We're simply never going to know these kinds of details. Last week, somebody wrote to me about the uh, person of, of St. Paul. And he said that, um, what, was St. Paul ever married? Well, how many times we've discussed this? Many times. We don't know if he was ever married. Some people say, and they insist, he must have been married because he was a Pharisee, and it was required for, to be a Pharisee that you be married. So people read this on the internet. Also, someplace in Acts, St. Paul talks about how he voted against the Christians. So now they're saying that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. You know, this is pure speculation. This is not only the kind of thing we avoid, but we can never be certain about this. Why do you want to insist? We, how, why do you want to find out if St. Paul was married? We will never know whether he was ever married. Clearly, at the time that he's a missionary, he's not married. He either never married or his wife died. But you can't prove it because guess what? There were eight different kinds of Pharisees in Jerusalem alone in the first century. Some of them were more strict and some were more liberal. There were eight different kinds because they didn't agree. So what kind of Pharisee was St. Paul? Do you know? Can we ever know? Does it matter whether or not he was ever married or not? I mean, can you see why many of you obsess over these questions that have no bearing on your spiritual life? We were not given this information and we're not supposed to meddle. It's absolutely unprofitable. Was he on the Sanhedrin? I don't think so. Why not? Because he was very young. I don't think that he was on the Sanhedrin, but people want to know more, so they invent things. This is how the Apocrypha gets started. People, at the, if the, they were curious back then too, just like you're curious today to know more about the Virgin Mary. People were curious back then, so somebody wrote this false book and called it the Proto-Evangelium of James, but it's full of falsehoods. So it's not good to read these things, and it's not good to seek to pursue things which are have not been revealed to us and which we can never know. Give it up and focus on things which are useful in your spiritual life. Okay, that's my words of advice for you today. So once again, and people kind of know, I get off on this question about the Apocrypha. I'm not, I'm not angry about it. I just want you to understand how pointless it is, how useless it is, and how unspiritually, spiritually unprofitable it is. If you knew more about her daily life in the temple, would that really affect how you related to Jesus Christ? Would that really affect your spiritual life? It's better for us to read the writings of the fathers, read the lives of the th saints, things that will inspire us, rather than knowing details about whether she was visited by her parents or, or anything else. You see what I'm trying to say? So this, in order to have an Orthodox fronima, one of the main things we have to recognize is what we can speak about, what we know and what we don't know. And the things that we don't know, we are supposed to leave alone. How does the bread and wine change into the body and blood of Christ? Do you want to explain that to me? Do we try to explain that? Well, Catholics try to explain it. We Orthodox never do. So this is in keeping with the Orthodox mind that we do not attempt to explain things that we simply cannot know. And we have to, in humility, accept that and focus on what we do know and how this can benefit us. Read the scriptures and study the scriptures. Don't try to meddle into finding out things which no one can ever know, okay? Because that's a distraction. I really believe, excuse me for saying this, for those of you who are obsessed with this, I believe it's of the devil. I really do. 
because he wants to distract us from things which are spiritually profitable and send us off on a wild goose chase to find out more about the Virgin Mary and whether Paul was married and what happened to the dinosaurs and Adam and Eve. All of these things are useless for us, spiritually speaking. So they are a distraction for our mind. Can you understand that? So that's why I'm encouraging you to accept what we know. It is good for us to learn more, as you are learning tonight, about the temple and life in the time of Christ. Those things we can know, but other things we cannot know, and it's best to leave them alone, okay? So now let's close with our prayer. Next week, we're going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about the Akedah, and that is the sacrifice of Isaac and how that relates to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Okay, so join us next week. We'll talk more about these things. Lord, now let your servants depart in peace according to your word. For our eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to enlighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Amen. <laughs> 